winds range from about 20 to 30, but the wind sometimes would get up to 35 knots, which is about 40 mile an hour. And you combine that with the, with the cold air, it was really cold, uh, which was expected. And this was summertime, because you're going down there in December of uh, the year, which is uh, summertime for them. In the, in the winter, which is in June, the temperature will reach 100 below, and the winds will reach 100 mile an hour, so it's pretty cold out. <laughs> Like it was in January, Jerry. Yeah. Yeah. I have about 500 pictures, here, so it should be done at about five o'clock. No, sure. <laughs> um, so let's see if we can get started here. That's Virginia and I, and those are the, the coats that are presented to us by Overseas Adventure Travel, which is the agency we went through. And you can see in the background the mountains. We were on the ship here at that time. That was probably one of the first days. And you, uh, let's just continue on here. Uh, before we get to Antarctica, though, we had to make a stop in Buenos Aires because that was where our plane landed after we left uh, Florida. And the tour guide there was a lady named Sylvia Lopez. And she insisted that we go to this Eva Perón mausoleum because that's for them. She was a goddess in uh, Argentina. And we went there. The size of your mausoleum dictates where your, your social strata was in life. The bigger the mausoleum, the more important were to those people. And this one was, was pretty nice. Each day there were flowers brought to this mausoleum to honor Eva Perot. She was uh, she was to the people everything. She she came from a real poor <coughs> background. Uh, she married. ship. Uh, we were on the 
the second level carried about 106 passengers and 30 <coughs> crewmen. The, there were four different groups. Each had their own leader. Ours was Sylvia Lopez. She was an Argentine. And uh, the other three groups had other people from Argentina. I really didn't get to know the others. We pretty much stayed in our own group. And our position on the ship was in the second level. There were three levels of rooms. Like I said, 106 people with 30 crew. It took us two days to cross the Drake Passage. And uh, that was kind of an experience. On the way down, it was really windy. On the way back, it wasn't. And that's the way they say it usually works. Are you going to have a rough trip there or a rough trip back? And ours was going down. I didn't get seasick, but Virginia did. She stayed in bed for a day. Um, that wasn't pleasant uh, to see her that sick. And there were several, several other people that were pretty ill, too. The ship would, would roll about four to five degrees this way and then four to five degrees that way. As you walk down the hall, as you, you're constantly bumping into one side of the other, because you never know which way to roll. One of our neighbors, you know, a lady from California, got up in the middle of the night to use the restroom, and she fell and slid across the floor on her stomach and hit her head on the kick plate. And the next, her husband got up and took her to the, to the ship's doctor, and they stitched her up. She had six stitches above her eye. So that was kind of a, an eye-opening experience for her and for the rest of us. This is the town of Ushuaia, which is the southernmost city in the world, the tip of South America. And this is where we departed from to go across to the, the continent of Antarctica. Uh, it was really cold that day. Um, you can see it's 12-4, so it was in the early part of our trip. We spent a day in Ushuaia walking around. It was just a cold, bitter uh, day. <coughs> beds we slept in, you're belted in bed. <laughs> <laughs> and that really did help because as it rolled, if you weren't in uh, you know, with the belt on, you'd roll out of bed. <laughs> wow. There's uh, another picture that the belt's dead. There's the library on board if you were not feeling well because of sea sickness, you could go to the library and just kind of rest. And there's a lot of people that didn't use the library for that reason. I said on the way down it was rough, on the way back it wasn't bad. So most of the people had uh, problems with their stomach had it on the way down. Uh, I, I had the patch on like everyone else did. And I, I didn't feel well for a day, but I didn't really lose it like a lot of people did. You don't have to give us great details. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is, a, I don't know if you can see it, but these four drawers on each side, there's metal rods that go down from the top of the to, to the drawers, and I wondered when we got on board, what's that for? Well, that's to keep the drawers in place. When the ship would roll, those drawers would roll out. <laughs> so those rods held the, those drawers in that cabin. Uh, we figured that out after the first night. We got up in the middle, I think, what's all that noise? Where are those drawers are rolling out? <laughs> this is the, uh, when we left to, to uh, get on the Zodiac, which is the rubber raft to go to the, to the uh, our landings, we had to turn these uh, these pin or these uh, tokens over. They had a number on them. And that number belonged to you, and you turned it over when you left the ship, and you turned it back over when you got back. And that was the way they counted whether or not you were still left <laughs> on the beach or not. I got a call one day uh, after we came back and said, uh, "You didn't turn your your, uh, your, your token over." And I said, oh, sorry about that. So I had to go down and physically turn it over in front of them to make sure that I was who I said I was. And of course, my number was 77. Yeah, I think there's 106 on that board there, so that was the number of passengers we had. But they were very careful about security uh, and, you know, that you didn't get uh, left or, or injured. When you got on the boat, there were several people who could assist you because it was bobbing and weaving. You had to step off the stern into the Zodiac. They loaded that very carefully. One person would get on, walk to the front, sit on the right, and another would get on, walk to the front, sit to the left. So it was always balanced. There was about 10 or 12 on the Zodiac, so it took a while for them to load, but there was plenty of rafts uh, to take you to the beach. And like I said, you go to the beach, uh, do the landing, walk around, and then when 
And every time you come back, you just reboard the Zodiac and come back to the ship. And then when you got on, you'd have to decontaminate your boots because they didn't want any of that debris that you picked up on the beach to uh, get on the boat. So you'd walk in this little uh, puddle of water there that would decontaminate. Put your boots away, then you'd go in and turn your token over and that's what you were back on board. Like I said, we did nine landings. Uh, and some days we did two morning and the afternoon, and by the end of the day, you were pretty tired, but by the time you get on the boat, after you dress all up and, and you go to the, to the landing, walk around, get back on, come back, it was quite an ordeal. And it was always windy on the water, no matter how calm it was, it seemed like there was always a wind coming off the water that would really chill you, and by the time you got back, it was pretty cold. They seemed to clean their boots there, and that was required. You could get out of those boots and you did that, and you'd store the boots in lockers in the back. Zodiac boat. There's lifted by crane onto the water. Uh, the captain of the ship, uh, he is really the king. I mean, if, if he said you didn't go, he didn't go. Uh, and they would make sure before they uh, that you went to a landing that it was calm enough to get on board the Zodiac without risking some harm to the uh, to the passengers. That's the Zodiac. There's our ship out in, the, in this bay, and you can see the Zodiac boat going out there in front. There's a few penguins sitting there in the, on the snow and ice. It, like I said, it's a great trip, but I probably wouldn't go back again with more penguins, because once you've been there, uh, no reason to go back. Our, our leader, expedition leader, he was in charge of all the groups, was a Brit named John Frick. John had made this trip 15 times. I guess he's, he's paid well for that. Some more of the, the snow and ice. It's a, it's a white wilderness. Every place you look, it's white with snow and ice. That's a skewer bird, S-K-E-W-E-R. Lots of those down there. They're very pretty birds. Lots, lots of birds. These people are standing out on a snow there looking across the bay. And it's Sylvia Lopez, our leader. She's a very proud Argentine. I, I like her though. She spoke three languages, Spanish, English, Portuguese. She was a graduate of some university in Buenos Aires. I don't know the name of it, but uh, she was an eligible person. And she was very <coughs> Six landings, but which uh, she would allow you not to make the other one if you want to. This is a uh, an abandoned scientific station. The Argentines used it for some kind of scientific uh, project. I'm not sure what, but uh, now it's kind of taken over by the penguins there. Those are elephants. It looks 
looks like we're going through it. He did not take us through this. He said, no, that's too dangerous. So we just went along the edge of it and looked through. But it was really kind of a pretty side. A lot of people thought that was a great picture taking uh, position in the quad picture. Yeah. Um, this is three members of the crew. The, the guy on uh, the left, if you look at the picture, was the chief cook. All these people that were crew members, except for the captain, were Filipino. And um, the food was great. They did a great job. You could eat as much as you want. Everything was a, uh, was a feast. And the wine drinking was pretty excessive, too. I didn't drink any wine. But uh, as long as you wanted to drink wine, they'd go to the wine glass. And I guess that was to compensate for some of the sickness. Here's a, a rock. On the ship? <laughs> what? Walking on the ship? No, airplane. Airplane. That's an airplane hanger in the background there. But it's not used anymore, obviously. But at one time, uh, they land seaplanes out in the uh, harbor there, I guess, whenever it was summertime, and they mentioned that in the hangar. I thought that was kind of interesting. We went to several whaling stations in terms of our landings that have been abandoned for years. And you can see all the equipment they use to process the whales in. Temperature, I think I took an average of between 20 and 32 degrees. Our highest wind was 35 knots, which is about 42 mile an hour. And we were at 64 degrees south latitude. And the, the South Pole is at 90 degrees. So we were quite a ways from the South Pole, probably about well, maybe a thousand miles. So a long ways yet to go to the South Pole. If you want to read anything about Antarctica, have a book here that I got for Christmas a couple years ago, and it's called The Endurance. It's about Shackleton's legendary expedition to South America, to uh, Antarctica in 1912. His goal, they'd already, uh, someone had already got to the South Pole, it was uh, a Norwegian explorer named Amundsen in 1910, I think it was, or maybe it was 1911. His goal was to cross the Antarctic continent, and he did, but it took him two years. He lost his ship in the ice, and it was two years before he was rescued by some other people from England. He was a, a Brit, and uh, he's a very proud man. He's buried in Antarctica because he was so in love with that place. I don't really know why, but uh, he was a explorer that thought that uh, it was important to him to, to do that. And he's highly thought of. It's a very good book. There's a lot of uh, information about what happened on that trip across the uh, Antarctic uh, continent and uh, the temperatures that they had to deal with, which, I, like I said, it was a 100 to below zero and 100 mile an hour winds. I can't imagine that. But, uh, and they all survived. There wasn't a member of that team that was lost. 